shall now uh, hand over to uh, Richard to tell us more uh, about uh, BBC Basic uh, for um, SDL. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, both that and BBC Basic for Windows, in fact, because the talk's entitled BBC Basic in the 21st century. So it's all the versions that I've developed in the last 20 years or so. Um, mind you, you've just reminded me that there's several things I probably should, should have been talking about that you've just mentioned, um, which I'm not going to cover at all, but we can discuss that in the questions and answers if you if you like. This is all new to me. Very first time I've ever used Zoom properly. So fingers crossed. That's looking good, Richard. Excellent, good. <laughs> it hasn't crashed yet, but we'll see what I might need to give it click on it to be double sure. Oh no, well that's that's taken me on to the next slide, which I hadn't entirely intended, but that's that's fine. Um, I just wanted to start um, just with a, as introduction and with some of the applications that my basics have been used for. You probably all know about these, but I just thought I'd throw them in. Um, it's only I think about a week ago now that the BBC repeated uh, the two more common wise episodes that have been recovered from the, the depths of Africa, Sierra Leone, I believe, um, as black and white films in quite poor condition. And um, they came to me for the original color to be restored using my color recovery software, uh, which is of course entirely written in, in BBC Basic, albeit a fair bit of assembler um, there's a lot of filtering. I mean, the way it works is largely based on two-dimensional digital filters. So the filtering is done in, in, in Assembler 32-bit x86 Assembler, but all the sort of logic and is traditional BBC basic code that you would recognize. Because um, there's nothing time critical about that. It, it runs pretty slowly anyway. It probably takes a couple of seconds to process one frame. So speed, wasn't that much of an issue. If I'd done it all in basic, it would have been, but as a hybrid basic uh, assembler program, it was perfectly doable. And as I've said before, BBC Basic is the only language I know really. I dabble in C, but uh, everything is done in BBC Basic, and this is a very good reason not to like developing the BBC Basic interpreter itself. Well, I'm a bit stuck. Anyway, let's move on. Another current application actually BBC Basic. This isn't it, but the BBC has a studio, television studio in Northern Ireland, um, which is a virtual studio, or at least can be. Um, so it's screen screen and has camera tracking apparatus. And what that picture is, is of the, uh, the so-called 3D camera tracking system, uh, which uh, works by having a little ancillary camera. You can see it there, probably the one that says Shotoku, which is a, an upward looking camera. So it, it looks at the ceiling of the studio and sees all these um, circular bar coded retro reflective discs that you can see. And it's able to work out from that image exactly the position and orientation of the camera. And that's what you need to know if you're going to do virtual studio because you have to work out where to display the virtual background according to the camera's orientation. So it's measuring the camera's position to about an accuracy of a millimeter in position and something like a hundredth of a degree in angle. And you need that because, especially with the zoom lens, only the fractional change in the camera's pointing angle will move the background by a few pixels. So it's, it's absolutely critical. Now that is BBC Basic and it is running in real time, 50 frames a second real time with a total latency through the system of only about one frame, maybe two frames. Again, there is a lot of assembler. I'm not kind of claim that's all done in interpreted basic code, but there is a lot of it in basic. So it's amazing what you can actually manage with, with a modern basic running on a fast machine. It's pretty fast PC, it runs on the eight core, I think. Um, okay. Now, this is just the third one of these introductory things. That's the Colosseum in Rome. This is not something I was involved with, um, but and I think it's still working. The Colosseum is equipped with a large number of seismometers because they have earthquakes in Rome, usually quite small ones, and they need to monitor exactly how some of their ancient monuments are coping with the uh, earthquakes. 
And um, that system is run under the control of a PC, the BBC Basic program. It uh, gathers all the data in from the, the seismometers, does something with it, it's able to display it in terms of various graphs and things, I think, and also exports it to the internet somehow or other. So I didn't develop that myself, but someone uh, uses BBC Basic to do that. Anyway, they're, they're just three examples of what you can do with modern BBC Basic. Oh yes, and this is just to decide, um, you know, this is, I'm going to talk about BBC Basic in the 21st century, but because I've been involved one way or another, like pretty much right back to the beginning. And indeed, when people have asked me, when did I start writing my Z80 BBC Basic interpreter, which was the original one, I tended to say it was probably a few months after the BBC Micro came out. Okay, that's my best guess. And then I came across this letter relatively recently, which showed that that was not the case at all. Um, dated, as you can see there, 28th of June, 1981. So that's months before BBC Micro was, was released, months before even uh, Sophie completed the 6502 version, although it was probably substantially finished by then, um, written to Herman Hauser. And it was about, it was on BBC headed note paper, so it was about various BBC related things, but I threw in at the end, the comment which you may or may not be able to read. Incidentally, I am as a private project in my own time working on a Z80 version of BBC Basic. I'm anxious that this should be as compatible as possible with the 6502 version in the BBC Micro, so would appreciate some inside information. Um, so I was obviously working on the Z80 version very early on, before, even before that date, um, which is, I have no recollection of now, but I think it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Unfortunately, I don't know what the inside information I received, if any, was, but of course there are aspects of my basics uh, which are very much like the way Sophie did things, the way the variables were looked up with linked lists and indexed by the initial letter, that kind of thing. I must have found out about that kind of internal implementation detail very early on. Mm -hmm. I've stuck with it ever since, no reason not to. Right, this is just a summary of the sort of things I'm planning to talk about. So this talk is like to be quite short, so I have plenty of questions ready at the end. Um, I'll just list the, the different versions of BASIC that I developed over that period and the platforms on which they run. Most of it is going to be deadly boring, I'm afraid. Most of it's going to be talking about the extensions I've uh, created to the previous BASIC language, largely just to keep it up to date. Um, I've been sort of determined to try and keep it competitive with modern languages, if you use the term Python and the like. Um, where I felt that BBC Basic was lacking, I've added extensions, and that's what I'll mostly be talking about. The rest of those there, I, mean, I know they occupy most of this slide, but they'll occupy only a tiny part of the talk, but just to some of the non-language features of, of my basics, because they're quite important to its usability. Um, so proportional space fonts, you can't do without that in a modern language as far as I'm concerned. Similarly, Unicode and even right to left printing scripts like Hebrew and Arabic, although Arabic has its own problems. I will briefly mention those later. Anti-alias graphics, also something that is sort of vitally important these days. You don't always need anti-aliasing, and of course it can slow it down dramatically, but not to have it at all would be pretty unsatisfactory in my opinion. Accelerated 2D graphics, that's something I get for free from SDL. Uh, it's not so much the case for the window, previous basic for Windows, the graphics on that are, are sort of done by Windows, but they're not hardware accelerated. SDL's 2D graphics are GPU accelerated, so they tend to fly. Um, 3D graphics, similarly, that's OpenGL in, in, in the case of my basics quite easy to access from the basic code because I've written some libraries uh, which make it relatively easy. Shader programming, that's something I've only really investigated recently. That's uh, possibly no, that's writing code for the graphics processor chip itself rather than the main CPU. Um, 
primarily for graphics, but you can use the GPU for other things. I haven't yet experimented with that, but in a sense, it's sort of the modern replacement for assembler. Assembler languages is all very well, but it immediately makes your code uh, platform specific. It's no longer portable. And I, with the introduction of the previous basic for SDL2, I'm trying very hard to make sure every program I write is portable. And that unfortunately means no assembler or assembly language written for at least four different varieties of CPU, 32-bit x86, 64-bit x86, and 32-bit ARM and 64-bit ARM. That isn't very attractive to have to write the code four times and still doesn't solve the problem entirely because it won't run in iOS because Apple refused to allow executing of uh, what they call arbitrary code. In other words, assembled code in RAM, you, you, you just can't run it. And similarly with the in-browser version, um, I don't know if it's even possible to write web assembly code in a sort of assembly language. It may be, but I have certainly no idea. So realistically, cross-platform programs have to avoid assembly language altogether. And the shader is, is a possible way around that because all GPUs use the same shader programming language. So you could, in principle, uh, incorporate some very, very fast code without sacrificing platform compatibility. And at some point, I want to investigate that further. I've done some graphics work, which you'll see later, but I haven't tried to use the GPU for anything else. And then finally, in that list, is physics simulations. Some years ago, I integrated the Box 2D physics engine, famously known for being used in Angry Birds. And I integrated that with Beavis Basic for Windows because it's it's rather neat and it's a lot of nice things. And it, it sort of links very nicely into the graphics capabilities of Beavis Basic as well. So more recently, I've made sure that all the uh, versions of Beavis Basic for SDL also have come with the Box 2D engine sort of integrated or as a linkable module anyway. Okay, well, these, these are the four principal versions of Beavis Basic that I've developed in the last 20 years with the dates in which they were released. Um, Beavis Basic for Windows, of course, was the first, 2001. Actually, almost exactly 20 years after BBC Micro was released, which is quite neat because it sort of halves the <laughs> intervening period, 20 years from BBC Micro to Beavis Basic for Windows, another 20 years to, the, to this year. Everything happens in sort of September or October this year as far as anniversaries are concerned. So it runs in Windows only. It's very tightly integrated with the Windows API. All the graphics is done that way, you know, file handling everything. Um, now of course, there's a big advantage in doing that. It means it has no dependencies. That's what allows me to create standalone executables that look as if they've been compiled, but because they haven't really been compiled, um, what happens is it takes a copy of the interpreter or runtime engine, as I would prefer to call it in that context, and then it, uh, in the same file, it embeds your basic program, somewhat compressed, and any resource files you might have, graphics, sound, and so on, bundles it all into one .exe file, which looks for all the world like a compiled program, but isn't. Of course, doesn't run any faster than, not much faster anyway than it would in the interpreter, but it's very, very convenient from the point of view of distributing Windows programs. But it makes it entirely platform specific, no, no chance of, well, apart from Wine, Wine is a emulation layer, which sort of pretends to be Windows, you can run that on Macs and Linux, but basically we're, we're talking about a single platform solution. Code in an assembly language, mostly, uh, certainly the interpreter of its entire assembly language. Um, and if you looked at the code, you'd see the heritage going right back to the Z80 version, each sort of step, Z80 then to the 16-bit version for MS-DOS, and then later to the 32-bit version of Windows. Uh, it's the same source code that's been edited and you'll still see comments from the very earliest Z80 versions probably still dotted around in the, in the Windows version. Right now, BBC Basic for SDL 2.0, that's the 
what I would consider my primary current version. That's free. I should have said Leaves Basic Windows, at least the full version you have to pay for. Um, Leaves Basic Steel 2 is free and open source. And I released that in 2015, initially only for Windows, Mac OS and Linux. And that was because it used at that stage exactly the same interpreter as BBC Basic Windows. It's the same assembly language, 32-bit x86 interpreter so it could only run on 32 bit x86 platforms which meant at least in 2015 uh, windows linux most linux systems although sometimes you have to install a 32 bit arch which some people didn't like to do and at the time mac os was still 32 bit and I was reasonably happy with that, especially as it was around about that time, coincidentally, that Intel were really pushing their Atom mobile CPUs, um, which of course are x86 instruction set, for use in, in phones and tablets. And there was a big incentive given to manufacturers of devices like that to use the Intel chip. I think they were heavily subsidized. So a few Android devices came out around about that time, which actually had x86 CPUs in, which was great for me because it meant I could do an Android version as well but only if you chose one of those very rare x86 android devices and i'm not really happy with with that it was much wider spread of platforms than these basic windows but then it all went wrong because intel decided that they were never going to succeed in the mobile arena they abandoned the atom all the few uh, android x86 devices disappeared and I was left with uh, Windows, Mac, OS, and Linux, and not a chance of running it on any ARM platform. And this was very sort of concerning to me, especially as I'd had an Android version and had lost it, which was very depressing. So I had a great sort of sit down and think and thought, is it practical to rewrite the entire interpreter in C? Could I actually manage that, given my <laughs> age and everything else? And to cut a long story short, that's what I did. It took me about a year um, to convert the whole interpreter into C. I didn't find it easy, um, but it has enabled me now to have versions that obviously cover a much wider spectrum of platforms, both ARM and 64-bit, because I couldn't I thought about it at some point, but I couldn't have realistically adapted the assembly language code to 64 bits. It would have been too difficult, but with C, it wasn't trivial, but it was relatively straightforward to make 64 bits. So I now have a, a uh, open source C version, which is on GitHub if you can look at, um, which can be com you know, compiled to all those platforms that I've listed there. It is slower, of course, than the assembly language version by probably a factor of two typically, but that's the price you have to pay. And that was that until last year. I suddenly had a sort of spurt of activity last year. I have no idea why. Perhaps it was lockdown or something. Not sure. Um, but two new versions came out last year. Uh, the in-browser version was the, was the first. Um, I'd known, actually, since I started to use SDL 2.0, it could target uh, either JavaScript or WebAssembly using the um, M scripting compiler. So I sort of knew that theoretically a browser version of BBC Basic might be possible, but the snag was it was single threaded only, no support for multi threading. And, and my basics, both the Windows and SDL2, are very much multi threaded. Might be slightly surprising, but it's because of the requirements of the modern GUIs. You have to guarantee a certain responsiveness in the GUI. Um, in uh, modern operating systems. And that's not very compatible with a, the interpreter that might go into a tight loop or you know, sitting in a get statement or something or in, or input. Um, you've really got to, oh, is that somebody else? You've really got to uh, make sure that the GUI remains responsive and the most straightforward way of doing that is multitasking. So I have a basically two threads, one runs the GUI, one runs the interpreter and that made it not compatible with the in-browser version until last year when um, Chrome initially and then the other browsers tended to follow introduced uh, support for multi-threading. And that's where we are today. 
All the browsers based on, or the desktop browsers based on Chrome, so that's Chrome itself, Edge, Vivaldi, Opera, Brave, maybe others that are based on the Chrome engine or the Chromium engine now support multi-threading and will run my browser version. Um, Safari won't. Apple again are different and I, whether they ever will support multi-threading, I don't know, but they don't now. And of course, Internet Explorer doesn't either, but that's largely obsolete. Fast mobile platforms are concerned currently only Chrome will support uh, multi-threading and that requires you to enable a so-called experimental feature. You have to go in and click on a allow box. Um, but that's the only mobile browser I think at the moment. Oh, I didn't mention Firefox. Firefox will also um, run it because it's not based on Chrome Engine, um, but it seems to be pretty good at uh, the multi-threading. Some things it's faster, some things it's not so fast, but yeah, it does run in Firefox. And then lastly in that list, the console mode editions, that, that, that sort of, that it's different because they have, they're not SDL, they're not Windows. There's no graphics, there's no sound, there's no joystick, there's none of that. They're, they're minimal console mode only that use uh, standard in, standard out. Um, so same interpreter, exactly the same previous basic language, all the extensions I'm going to talk about later run fine on the uh, uh, the console mode, but um, it's not BBC Basic perhaps as, as you might be familiar with, but it, handy for some things like scripting, you can run it across a link to a remote console or serial link or internet or something. You can even use it as your shell if you're particularly masochist. It's quite interesting to use BBC Basic as your shell. Okay, so I'm now just gonna run through the extensions to the language, which is what, primarily what I'm going to be talking about. Um, new keywords. Keywords, of course, are a problem. If you add a keyword, you instantly introduce potential incompatibility because, um, because if you've used that same word as a variable name in a, in a program, it's not going to work. Or it's not going to work if you tokenize it. It might do if you if it starts off as tokenized and you don't retokenize it, but typically using the uh, word that you've introduced as a new keyword uh, in, a, in a program, an earlier program as a variable, it's not going to run. So I'm very, very reluctant to add new keywords. I've only ever added two. And once you see that exit, I'll mention those in detail later. Mostly I've reused existing keywords because that's safe. Well, pretty safe. Um, you know that uh, they won't already occur in programs in that unique context other than a keyword. So nothing is going to go wrong as a result of you know, using them in other, in other senses. And there's plenty of ways in which you can extend the ways existing keywords are used. And there's new data types. Um, my strings are unlimited length. Bibbs Basic is, is, is strange really. I can understand why the 6502 version had maximum 255 character length strings, especially with the limited memory and everything. That all made perfect sense. I don't understand why basic five also has a limit 255 strings. I would have thought at that stage, so we would have extended at least to 65535. And Brandy, of course, does. And all the flavors of Brandy support long strings, but the basic five doesn't mystery that to me. Um, anyway, mine do. It's a theoretical 32-bit length, of course. In practice, you probably only want to have strings up to a few megabytes, but nevertheless, or perhaps longer. Null terminated strings, handy for sort of interchanging with the operating system because that's a more common format than carriage return terminated, which is traditionally BBC Basics native sort of terminated string variety. 8-bit integers. That was very easy to implement. In fact, I know that Michael's implemented it in uh, Matrix Brandy too, because BBC Basic does have support for 8-bit integers, always has, in the sense of the question mark indirection operator. So adding 8-bit integer variables was actually extremely straightforward. 64-bit integers, less so, but vital these days. You can't sort of have a 64-bit version of BBC Basic without 64-bit integers. Um, but even my 32-bit versions do support 64-bit integers. 80-bit floats, yeah, 
handy if you want very, very high resolution numbers. But that only works on x86. Um, ARM chips don't do 80-bit floats, sadly. The original ARM floating point, separate floating point coprocessor did, but for some reason I don't understand when the FPU was integrated with ARM chips more recently, they dropped support for 80-bit floats. They've only got 64-bit floats. Um, and then structures put possibly, well, probably the most important sort of new data type in my basics is structures. All modern languages support structures. They're absolutely invaluable in my opinion. Um, I'd quite like, I'm sure Mike was listening, I'd quite like other versions of BBC Basic to support structures, but we'll see. And then a few miscellaneous things that don't fit in the other categories. Okay, so a bit of detail on the uh, in these uh, extensions. The, the two new keywords, exit, exit works exactly like break in C, if you're familiar with C, and uh, provides a legitimate way of jumping out of a loop. BBC Basic is quite nasty, actually, because the obvious way of jumping out of a loop is go to, and it will appear to work. And indeed, many basics, especially compiled ones, that is the official way of jumping out of a loop. You can use go to quite safely because they detect that you've jumped out of the loop and do all the necessary cleaning up. But not BBC Basic, you jump out of the loop with go to, fine, but you leave stuff on the stack. And it, that's a really insidious potential bug because your program might continue to work seemingly perfectly okay. Could be, could be hours, days, months, you just don't know. And then eventually without any warning at all, the stack will get you to start and it will fall over. So jumping out of the loop with go to is very bad news. And then you do have to have ideally an official way of doing it. So I thought exit was really important. Um, you can use it for for loops, repeat loops or while loops. Um, additional feature there with the for loop is you can actually specify the loop variable so you can jump out more than one layer. If you've got two or three nested for loops, you can actually exit the whole lot all in one go. Five, again, this is based on C. That's like static in C. It's exactly the same syntax as local, which everybody will be familiar with. But the thing about local, of course, is that all the variables and arrays that you've specified in a local statement get cleared when you leave the procedural function and get reinitialized to zero or whatever on the way in. So they're, they're no use if it's a variable that you want to hold its value from one call of the function to the next. And that's what static does in C and that's what private does in my basics. Um, it's actually very easy, easy to implement. They are globals because the traditional way of having a variable that is preserved from one call of a function to the next is to make it a global. Very easy. There's nothing wrong with that except that it breaks all the modern sort of scoping rules. These days one is supposed to adhere to what they like to call information hiding or uh, encapsulation, the various words for it, but it basically means don't allow your variables to be seen outside the context in which they're used. Um, so that's the value of static in C or private in here because uh, those variables can't be seen outside. Well, they, they possibly could be seen, but they won't have the value that they have inside the function that's you know, preserved from one call to the next. And I make huge use of, of that in my code. But they're the only two new keywords. Everything else is, is uh, reusing existing keywords. Uh, call is the first of those. Call, as you know, normally calls some machine code, assembly language code, you specify either just the start address or a parameter list. But you, you can never legitimately have call followed by a string in standard beauty basics. So that was an obvious extension that I could borrow without introducing incompatibility. And call file name string works a bit like an include function. It um, takes the file name of a tokenized basic program, temporarily loads it into memory, runs it, and then discards it. So it's handy for a number of things, like you might have some large assembly language routine, and you don't really want to float to your program or the RAM with the assembly language source code. So you can plant that in a separate file, call it, that will then assemble the code to RAM, and then you can discard the source code. You don't want the source code anymore. 
And you can also use it for the sort of traditional things that C uses include for, like header files or definition files that you want to define a whole load of variables, say, but you don't particularly want to keep the source code that does that because it's a once-off operation. Okay, get um, get string. Um, I've added the option of a, a bracketed pair of parameters. <clears throat> what, the, what this is doing is, if you're familiar with, with OS Byte 135, which is the standard way of doing this on the BBC Micro or you know, basic five or whatever, um, it's a way of reading back from the screen the character at a particular coordinate. Now with, with OSPI 135, you have to move the cursor there first, and then you set 8% equals 135 and faff around, and do a user FFF4, whatever it is, and you get back the character at that point. Well, that's fine, but it's messy. Um, this, this extension with the get keyword just gives you a straightforward, quick way of getting back the character at a specified coordinate within the text viewport. And then the next one, which is the highlight, I only coded that in the yesterday, so I better use it. Um, get string hash. If you're not a BBC Basic 5 uh, fan, you won't know this, but that's the way, uh, an alternative way of reading from a file in, in Basic 5. Um, does it rather different from what input hash does. Um, but it just reads the file until it gets either to a carriage return or a line feed or a null termination. And that's, that's, that's your lot. That's the only options you've got. And that's very limiting, at least I found it very limiting. So I've extended get string hash um, by means of either the, the by keyword, which is already there. It's not a new one. It's, it's plot by and move by and all those. Again, that's a basic kind of thing. Um, using by, you can say, I want to read this number of bytes from the file. And because my strings are long strings, that can be anything. And it can be the entire file, reading the entire file into one string variable is actually a, a very, very useful thing to do if you've got empty memory, which you would do by saying, get string hash file by x hash file. Get the, read the file by the total length of the file. And the other addition I've done there is using the two keyword. That allows you to specify a terminator different from the standard character nine feet or none. So if you want to read up to uh, any specific terminator, you can do that. All right. Now these are these are sort of quite different really to anything that's been possible in BBC Base before. These are for event handling. All, all modern operating systems tend to be event driven. The expectation is your program will not be polling for things but will be sitting there waiting for an event, uh, a synchronous event to come in from the operating system. And BBC Basic doesn't lend itself very well to that. Um, anybody who's done GUI programming on, on the um, Archimedes and such like devices will know that it's quite messy and you have to poll uh, to, get, to get events. Um, that just wasn't really compatible with the way things like Windows and Mac OS work, where you're expected to be in a position to respond to events. So that's, that's my solution to, to that. These are, they specify a handler routine that gets called if each of these events occur. So on close, followed by some code, that code will be run if you attempt to close the window. And that's obviously really useful if, for example, you've got some unsaved memory, uh, unsaved data of some kind, and you want to give your user the opportunity to save it before exiting. Also very handy if there's some cleanup operations you need to do in your program before exiting. Um, incidentally, as it says there, these, these sort of, they fake a go sub. Um, it's very easy to do, in fact. So to exit the handler, you use return. On mouse, uh, that interrupts the program if you click the mouse, pretty obvious. On move, that interrupts the program if you either move or resize the window. It's normally resizing that you're interested in, but there wasn't a suitable keyword I could use there, so it's on move. But it does interrupt as well on moving the window. Relatively rare that you wanted to know about that. On, on sys is a, sort of a bit of a everything else thing. If there are any other events that the operating system needs to alert you to that don't fit into the other categories, it tends to cause an on sys interrupt. 
and then there's on-term time. That's just a periodic time, and that's very handy if you want to do any kind of background work. Um, if you've seen my little CFAX emulator program, it's how the, uh, the clock is maintained in the, the, in the head row. Uh, there's an on-time interrupt that just uh, updates the clock. And you can actually choose the periodicity of the timer, but by default, it's relatively slow for hertz or something like that. Now here's another one that I find incredibly useful. I don't understand, well, again, another one I don't understand why Sophie never implemented it because it's so easy. It um, does what functions and procedures normally do on exit. In other words, they restore all the formal parameters, local variables, arrays, what have you. In my case, private variables, they're all restored to the values they had uh, on entry. That's obviously what you need. But there's no way on the standard BBC basic of restoring all those local variables other than exiting from the function. And that's potentially a major problem if you're trying to track errors. Because if an error occurs in your function, then you don't want it just to abort. You want to take some specific action to either recover from it or whatever. Um, you really want to be able to track the error within the function restore all the local and private what have you parameters to the value they had and then do something which might be exiting the function down to a lower level and so you want to handle it at the level below all sorts of things you might want to do but the important thing is you need to be able to restore all those local variables and parameters what have you without actually exiting the function that's what restore local does and it's so easy to implement oh, i found it so because all the code to do that is already there you just trigger what they, the function would normally have done on exit. Uh, very useful, I think. Right, how we go to time? Right. Um, pointer, now again, PTR pointer in standard basic is always followed by a hash. It's used to read or write the final pointer, of course, but rather than conveniently, uh, the hash isn't part of the token. If it had been, it would have completely killed my options, but PTR, the token is PTR, the hash is separate, so I can borrow it for other purposes. And being able to access pointers of things in general is quite useful. Um, so uh, on mine, it can read or write the, a string pointer. Um, so if you've got a string and you want to get a, the address of its first character, you can do it that way. Quite handy if you want, for example, um, process the contents of a string using indirection which can be quite a lot faster than using string functions. Um, you can also play around with the pointer to uh, an array, although that's less likely to be useful occasionally. Pointer to a structure, very handy, um, because structures can be used for things like linked lists, and then you need to be able to move your structure to a specific place in memory, and we can do that with this extended pointer function. Um, Sys this is another one where at the moment of sand is basic. Um, Sys is a, a statement. It can only be used as a statement. It was never used as a function. So I've extended it by using it as a function. And what it does is you, you pass as a parameter the name of an API function. Um, and it returns the numeric equivalent. And the reason that's useful, of course, is that Sys number is quite a lot faster than sys name. So if you're doing a lot of sys calls in a program, you prefer not to have to specify the function by name every time because that's quite slow. It has to be looked up somewhere. Better to specify the function by its numeric value, like a SWI or its actual memory to best depending on operating system. So having a way to find out the magic number which corresponds to any named function is handy. Uh, something else I think that Mark has implemented in when I in um, Something again, now the width here, its use of the function is new. This is really only handy for proportional space text. It's trivial to work out the width of a string, obviously, normally, because each character is the same width. They just have to multiply the length of the string by the width of the character and job start. But you can't do that with a proportional space string. And if you're trying to do something like center it, you need to subtract its width from the width of the window and half that and what have you. So width 
takes a parameter of a string and tells you how long it will be in graphics units. Approximately, I have to sort of add the curling can confuse things. So you shouldn't trust it being pixel accurate, but it's near enough for centering. Might not be near enough if you leave the length of the width of the string really precise. To and now weight, weight in standard basic, well, 35, um, doesn't take any parameters. It just waits for the next vertical sync, um, which I can't do, or at least I can't do in BBS Basic Windows because there isn't a wait for vertical sync OS API available in standard Windows. So that doesn't work, unfortunately, online. But I have extended the statement by allowing you to specify a numeric parameter. And then that just means wait for that number of centiseconds. Not tremendously useful because you can use in key to do a similar thing, but of course, within key, the, the delay is aborted as soon as you press a key and it also swallows the key press, which you may not want. So if you literally do just want to wait a certain period of time, this is better. Um, and as it says there, you can say wait zero as just a way of freeing the CPU if you're, as it always will be these days, in a, a multi-tasking and context in an operating system you don't actually have anything to do for the moment. You want to say, please give all the rest of my CPU time to some more useful process. You can say wait zero. Typically waits a millisecond if there's nothing else to, to do. You know, on of course a multi-core CPU, which pretty much all PCs are, it's likely to return in a millisecond, but not necessarily. Longer than I anticipated. <laughs> um, well, I, as I mentioned st regular strings have a, a limited length, so well, 30 bit length. Um, for point two, I've also mentioned there, covered that. Um, a null terminated string, it's similar syntax to the carriage term terminated string, except that it's two dollars rather than one. And again, I've mentioned some of these unsigned 8-bit integers. I'm using the ampersand character as the suffix, sort of free. I mean, I know it's used to indicate hex, but it's only used as a prefix in the context of hex. This uses it as a suffix. So there's a bit of a incompatibility when it comes to print, because print lists don't have to have delimiters, but mostly there's no compatibility issue there. Um, standard, oops, standard, um, I don't know why this is in there, but it's just obviously single percent, 32 bit signed integer, 2 percent signs, 64 bit signed integer. Hash suffix, 64 bit flow. The reason I've done that is that operating system functions, API functions, very commonly want you to pass um, floating point numbers in 64 bit double format. Unless that's not the native, or not always the native floating point format. That just forces it to that format. If you put a hash afterwards, it's guaranteed to be 64-bit float. Not really any other use other than, well, it saves it up in memory, but other than passing them to the OS. Um, not going to go into this here because it's been covered in, in other threads on Stardot, but my numeric variables or floating point variables aren't right from the Z80 version. My suffix list numeric variables have been variants. They've not been floats. They can contain either a floating point number or an integer, but that's not an extension. That's my basics have always done that. Structures, as well, I've said, I think they're incredibly useful. I had a bit of a trouble you know, devising a syntax that was both sort of in keeping with, well, I felt, in keeping with BBC Basic and didn't involve any new keywords. So I've just, um, Borrowed dim, but instead of using round brackets parentheses, you use curly bracket spaces. And instead of listing the sort of maximum suffix value on the array, you list uh, the members of the structure in order. And they can be either scalar variables or arrays or substructures. That could, I mean, a whole talk could be devoted to structures in business um, There's another extension there of the dim keyword to return the size of a structure which you very commonly want. And then substructures, you can nest them to any depth. You can have a structure which has inside it a substructure which has inside it a sub-substructure and ad infinitum. 
and arrays of structures, as you might expect. Um, slightly contrived syntax had to be, but works very nicely. Um, yeah, it is basically a bit strange. It has this at percent thing for specifying the, the format in which numbers are printed. All very well, but a bit sort of peculiar because it's a unique variable that starts with at. And I thought, why can't you have other variables starting with at? That could be a handy feature, I thought. Uh, and that's what my basics do. There's a whole load of predefined variables. You can't create your own. Like at percent, they're predefined variables. But they do let you access a whole load of things like BDU variables and basic internal variables, which in traditional BBC basic, you probably have to access via an OSBY or an OSWORD or something. But um, this just provides a fast and convenient way of getting at them with an app symbol followed by the name of a variable. Now, now, these are only of interest to the cruncher. You don't, they don't affect you if you're writing a program conventionally. But as you'll appreciate, one of the problems with BBC Basic that tends to make it rather slow sometimes, and it's fast language, but can be slow, is variable lookup because of all this, these uh, linked list tables. If you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of variables in your program, it can take a little while to find them. And so what I've done is I've borrowed some token values and the cruncher replaces a standard variable name or optionally replaces the standard variable name by one of these uh, special tokens followed by a two byte index that means it can access the variable very much faster um, and irrespective of how many it's meant how many variables you've got um, you've got a little bit to 65,000 because it's a two byte value but um, much, much faster potentially than the conventional variable lookup, but doesn't affect the program, it's something that's done automatically by the cruncher. And you can turn it off if there's some reason why you need the true variable name to be kept, like if you're accessing it with eval. Line continuation character, some other, another big limitation of this paper, of course, is that lines are maximum 251 tokenized characters. So uh, not the first language to use backslash for this, by any means I borrow backslash as a way of splitting a single long logical line into multiple physical lines and overcome the line length limitation that way. Quite useful, very useful for defining a structure because you can then put each member of the structure on a separate line. Address uh, of operator. Not often used because that PTR function that I spoke about earlier is slightly more useful. But this just returns the address that the variable sits at. I think any version of BBC Basic could have been able to do this because it has to know that, but it's just a way of exposing the address of a variable to your program, sometimes handy. <clears throat> and 64 bit indirection, a lot of discussion about what character to use, ended up with the right hand square bracket. I'm not going to explain the reasoning for that, but it was pretty much the only character left. Speeding up a bit because it's taking longer than I thought it would. Um, yeah, another thing that is very, very handy occasionally is be able to call a functional procedure, not by a name, but by a pointer. Um, sort of a bit like on proc, only you know, there's no limitation to fitting in one line. You can have as many procedures as you like indexed by their pointer. So the address of operator I mean, circumflex there is used to get you a pointer to a procedural function and then you can call that procedural function by using the syntax proc on fn followed by that address in bracket so you end up with if it's got parameters you end up with two bracketed things there the uh, function address in the first pair of brackets and then the parameters in the second pair of brackets or dare i mention my basics have labels because well, the basic <laughs> the excuse I give is that some years ago I wrote a, um, an emulator of Liberty Basic, which basically translated Liberty Basic programs into BBC Basic. But of course, Liberty Basic has labels, makes extensive use of labels, so I needed labels. I don't recommend anybody use them, but uh, my basics do have labels. Oh, I only threw this in because it was a, being discussed over at the Viscos forum a little while ago. 
the absence of dynamic dynamic memory allocation capability in standard BBC Basic, because as you, you know, you can only allocate memory on the heap using dim or on the stack using dim local, all very well, but yet it's very limiting in how you can, you can't sort of freely allocate three blocks of memory in any order. Um, point I wanted to make here is that BBC Basic does in fact support dynamic memory allocation. It supports it for strings, but not for anything else. <clears throat> so those little, the couple of little functions and procedures there just um, cheat the system and they borrow the memory allocation, the allocator that's used for string memory and use it to provide memory blocks. That's about the interest. Okay, well that, that's it as far as extensions to the language itself is concerned. I just want to run through some of the things that my, all my basics, but not the console my versions, but all the others have built in as standard. Um, true type and open type proportional space fonts, essential as far as I'm concerned. Unicode equally can't really justify having only code pages to support internationalization these days. Unicode is essential. There's uh, some Cyrillic there, et a demonstratia, a sisk of a texta, et a prescientia, slira na pravo. It means something like this is a demonstration of Russian text. It's written left to right. It means something like that anyway. And then there's some Arabic, which I can't read. Arabic is tricky because of all the variable letter forms. And um, there's quite a lot of code, it's basic code, but there's quite a lot of code involved in rendering that. And it's right to left, because BBC, well, it's not the function of basic, it's operating system, but BBC Micros and other machines, or basic um, masters anyway, have um, right to left printing capabilities built in. Anti-alias graphics, oh, here's, here's an animated, and that's moving slowly. I don't think you'll have any difficulties seeing that. If you do, we're in trouble with some of the subsequent slides. Here's an animated slide showing anti-alias graphics, which I do with the library. I mean, it's not built in, but I supply a library. And that red line at the bottom with the arrow on the end is not horizontal, but there should be no jaggies. The sort of um, fawny, browny colored vertical arrow line on the left is also not vertical, but hopefully there's no nasty editing. And that rotating square would look horrible in conventional pixelated graphics. This is going more quickly, so I have no idea what this is going to look like to you. It looks great to me. That's 80 sprites, um, all plotted in real time, scaled, um, rotated, and, sh and shadows, entirely in basic by calling STL2's you know, accelerated function. So I mean, that's the sort of thing that you can do in pure basic with the help of STL. That same program runs in BBC Basic for Windows, but that's about a tenth of the speed. But that's, that's again, all pure basic, but calling OpenGL in this case. So it's sort of tunneling through STL. That's something that STL supports. Um, and all rendered in real time in OpenGL with, with lighting cal calculations, specular reflections. This is a famous uh, demo of what you can do by programming a shader. That's the GPU. Um, this is a, a, a photorealistic seascape calculated in real time from scratch. Nothing pre-rendered there, no video, no, no sprites or anything. This is all calculated in real time. I, even if you haven't got feel for the smoothness of the motion, which you won't, I hope the, the realism of the sea may, may not be too bad. It's certainly spectacular here. Um, so it's not my code, of course, it's to say it's a standard demo, but it's been transplanted into BBC Basic, which is quite easy to do. And finally, nearly at the end, so I've nearly used my hour, I didn't expect to. This is physics simulation. This is about the, the simplest kind of physics simulation you can do, but it just proves the point. Falling boxes, which um, again, it probably doesn't look terribly good to you, but you'll get a you'll get a feel for it. And that's through this um, integration of the box 2D physics engine. So it's very easy to code this sort of thing in basic. And that's it. Got to the end. 
Any questions? So I just wanted to say, uh, first of all, thank you for a, a, a brilliant uh, presentation. That was really interesting. Um, there are quite a few questions which I'll come to in a moment, but just so you know, those last two demos, yes. certainly on my screen, the waves and the falling boxes look really good. I don't think we were getting sort of 60 frames per second. Oh, you way. weren't, no. But, no. but the waves were very impressive and the physics was good as well. Um, yeah. You know, I think we had, uh, it was better than the sprites in terms of what- uh, Yes, I'm not surprised, yeah. Yeah, probably more like proper video and therefore cope with it rather better. Yeah. So, so before uh, um, I turn to the questions from other people, taking advantage of my uh, role as host, um, a, a couple of years ago, I went to a demonstration at, uh, and I never get the pronunciation right, the Raugel or Rogel, but the OS Riscos uh, group. Um, yeah. And uh, somebody was using a Raspberry Pi to control GPIO. Yeah. And they were using the built-in basic, BBC basic in risk odds, um, yes, uh, yes. which I can see its attraction, but I can see other reasons why one might not want to do that. Is there a mechanism um, in the Raspbian version of BBC Basic for SDL for reading from and writing to GPIO? Absolutely, yes. It comes with a library called, not surprisingly, GPIO lib.bbc, which is specifically for doing exactly that. And there's a demo somewhere I can't immediately point it to you of um, lighting some LEDs in sequence from a BBC Basic program in Raspbian. You talked about the browser-based version. Um, is it correct to say that it doesn't run at all on non-Chromium browsers, or does it just not run as a multi-threaded uh, um, program on those browsers? Right. Well, it, it certainly runs in... Firefox, which is a non-Chromium browser, yeah. um, but it doesn't run at all in browsers that don't support multi-threading because multi-threading is just, it's just not optional in the way I've coded uh, BBC Basic for STL 2.0. There is no single threaded option available. So I'm afraid in browsers that don't currently support multi-threading, it just doesn't work. But hopefully, you know, it's, okay. it's, okay. it's only a reasonably short time since multi thirty was introduced into browsers at all. It would have happened about two years before, but then these nasty exploits um, came along, meltdown and whatever the other one was, and they realised that the multi-threading capability, which they were just about to sort of launch on the world, um, could exploit those, those weaknesses, and they stopped it. And it's only relatively recently, like about a year ago, that they worked out a way of enabling multi-threading in a safe way. And it's most of the browsers, or certainly most of the desktop browsers, as I said, now will. Safari doesn't, and that, that's probably an Apple policy thing, and there's no predicting what might happen. And then uh, there's this next question. I'm not sure... I'm not sure whether this is a whether this is a misunderstanding of what happens in the browser-based versions, but the question is, and it's not an easy question to read because it has symbols in it, uh, <laughs> and, it and, it's not, and I don't fully understand it anyway. But it says, uh, could you not use Canvas, Audio, and JavaScript gamepad extensions to make the browser basic not just console-based? Well, it's not. No, I, I, that's that's a misunderstanding. The browser yes, base that's what I thought. <laughs> two it is far from console. It's completely GUI. It has all the capabilities of the others. It has it has full graphics. It has two D graphics, three D graphics, it has shader graphics. Everything I've shown you, including those sprites, the seascape, the uh, physics demonstration, the three D rotating teapot. They all run in the browser version. No, it is fully, because of SDL, it's the magic of SDL. I take no credit for that aspect. SDL magically hides all the OS variability from you and presents the uniform interface to the application program, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, so it just works. The only aspect I had some problem with was 3D graphics because I relied on a feature of OpenGL which isn't supported in browsers, but I was able to work around that. So no, it's not at all a console mode. The browser version is full, everything, including um, graphics and what have you. So, uh, um, sorry, and I, I apologize for my ignorance here, but if I want to write a web app 
so that someone can visit my website and and see waves rolling around. Yeah. Um, does that mean I have to? What do I have to have on my on my web server for that to work? Presumably. Um, yeah, I mean, the simplest way of doing it is just to have the basic program on your server, and then you just generate a URL which fetches the the browser version of these basic from my website and then gets it to chain your program very easy to do it's just a way you just have to work out the correct syntax for the url i mean you could host your own copy of the basic in browser basic but i don't encourage that because it won't get updated when i make changes which i do quite regularly so whilst my website is not overloaded at the moment its performance touch wood is quite good i'd recommend that you fetch the browser from my, my site, and it'll be cached anyway, so it won't have to get it all the way from my site every single time. Um, so just put your basic program and any other resource files it might need, graphics or sound files, uh, on your site, and that's that's job done. Excellent. Um, that, that, that's uh, that's I just I, impressive. I, I, could, I could do a whole talk on how to use the browser version, but it, it's quite well, straightforward. Well, Yes, and so and the next question is from uh, Pixel Blip, who we're going to hear <laughs> from uh, in about half an hour about his teletext uh, editing program that he's written in your BBC Basic. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, he, he wonders so, what, what plans do you have for the future of BBC Basic? Not a lot. What plans do I have for the future of me? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty. I think one of the reasons that, that so much happened last year was I was conscious that I was sort of getting to a stage where I wouldn't be able to do a great deal more. One has to be honest about that. So I don't have any great ambitions beyond uh, where it's currently at, other than to sort of make sure it's maintained and keeps working and bugs are fixed. I mean, I'd love somebody to, to you know, do other things with it because I mean, I've made it open source. It's, you know, people... Can, can do things with it if they want to, but I don't think much has happened as yet as far as people are taking the code off GitHub and playing with it. Okay, and now the next question, uh, crikey, this is um, fairly niche stuff, I would imagine. <laughs> um, I'll just read it. The, does the Arabic code handle, uh, uh, does the Arabic code uh, handle selecting all the right glyphs in real time, for example, while a string is being entered a character at a time, or just uh, pre-calculated strings? Um, I've not tried that. I think, I mean, yes, the answer is yes, it would. But of course, if you're entering the char a character at a time, it can't always, well, it can't typically work out the correct um, contextual form until you type the next character, because the contextual form of the, the character, how it's actually rendered, can depend upon both the character that precedes it and the character that follows it. So if you're typing one character at a time, until you've actually typed the next character, it doesn't know necessarily how the previous one you typed should be rendered. So what it would do, I'm not sure whether my existing code would need to be altered very slightly to allow this, could be so. But what it ought to do in those circumstances is use some generic rendering of that character until it knows what the correct form would be. And I'm sure an Arabic reader wouldn't get too upset by the character being rendered in, in the wrong contextual form. That only really matters when the entire sentence has been entered. I'm, 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 if you don't know anything about Arabic, that'll be meaningless. <laughs> yes. Um... But each character basically has up to um, one, two, three, four, three different forms. It has a, a, a way of rendering when it's isolated. It has the way you should render it when it's at the beginning of the word, uh, a way of which it should be rendered when it's the end of the word and a way in which it should be rendered when it's in the middle of the word. So there are basically four shapes for each character. That's a bit of an oversimplification. Yeah. I mean, all these complex script languages, Arabic's by no means the worst, the Korean and things are terrible. Um, and I don't support contextual forms in those at all. The, the rules that would be needed to get it right always are phenomenally complicated. And you wouldn't be wanting to code those in basic. You'd probably want to be using a, a script engine that's designed to, to get it right. Like in mm -hmm. Windows, there's a thing called Uniscribe, which understands these languages. 
I wouldn't fancy personally coding that. If I was a linguist, maybe, but I'm not, I wouldn't fancy coding that in Basin. Yes. Um, so uh, uh, it's, it, the ZX guesser is the person who posed that question. And he says, um, this is exactly where I'm stuck in my code and why I still don't have Arabic entry. Um, yeah, well, it's, it's, he only needs to look at my program, uh, which is one of the programs that comes with BBC basic for SDL and the DPS basic windows. It's, it's called unicode.bbc. And he'll find in there uh, an FN Arabic, I think it is, a function which takes an Arabic string um, just using the basic alphabet and then returns a Unicode string that contains the contextual forms. But it's very specific to standard Arabic. It doesn't even work in, in, in Farsi or, or Persian because the rules are different. There are different characters. So if you wanted to generalize it to other languages, not easy. Uh, uh, yes, um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not, not the best conduit to pass <laughs> <laughs> the discussion on this subject because um, notwithstanding my fairly primitive understanding of coding, uh, um, it's also, <laughs> as you say, I have no experience of Arabic at all. Well, nor did I before I investigated. I just felt that I ought to make some effort to make BBC Basic support it because otherwise, and indeed, I do have you know, customers of BBC Basic in Arabic speaking countries, and, and they would be quite upset if there was no support for it at all. I think yes. they'd prefer it to be better, but I felt obliged to provide some support. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I think um, that is the end of the questions um, in uh, the chat window. Um, if anybody wants to um, pose questions directly to Richard, they can do. Um, but obviously, uh, you will be recorded both um, audio and vision. And I, and I would ask people, if at all possible, if they're uh, going to ask a question that way can they turn their camera uh, off so that we can uh, see their face when they ask the question i take that to mean that there aren't actually i'm, I'm breaking my own rule by having my own camera turned off um <laughs> i i take that to mean that there aren't uh, any further questions or if they're stunned people, into silence people who don't want to be recorded whilst they're asking their question which is always understandable Richard thank you so much uh, for giving uh, that talk um, it, it was absolutely fascinating and um, uh, and it was truly of interest because I think um, it demonstrates the power of BBC basic uh, but in addition it's a very accessible language. It's certainly accessible language to most people in this group who have experience in coding in it in the past. Um, but but I would um, I, I would feel much more comfortable working with your version of BBC Basic with all of its advanced features than trying to teach myself at my age to code in Python, which I'm sure is a very great language and is easy to understand. But it's just yet another thing to learn. Um, and um, I don't think we all have time to learn lots of new languages. So uh, thank you very much uh, indeed uh, um, uh, for that. Thank you, Richard. It's, um, friendly competition here. <laughs> makes, makes me feel a bit bad, actually. Yesterday evening, pointing out um, what I thought was a bug in the console version, which I think is most likely a compiler bug in CentOS 8. I've not been able to repeat it on any other platform. Indeed, I can't find a bug in the code, although as I, I mentioned to you uh, privately, that yeah. there's a possible buffer overrun, but I don't think it can be responsible for what you saw. I, yeah, I think I ruled that one up, so I moved it um, to another place in the code before mm. the definition mm. still fell over. And if Strange I compiler find... bug, though. I mean, I wouldn't have expected it to be a compiler bug, to be honest. But, but it only trips if um, optimized mm. level S or two or higher. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, one. If you ever, if you ever discover any more, I'm sure you'll let me know. I might um, see if I can um, arm twist um, my employer's uh, Red Hat subscription and rate and raise it with them. Because okay. it fails yeah. on CentOS eight, it'll fail on Red Hat Enterprise eight as well. But I will make the change you suggested anyway. Next time I, I'm playing with it to make that particular thing static, and that will solve it anyway, or hopefully. Yeah. But I think reporting it as a bug up to Red Hands should fix it. They might do something about it.
Very interesting talk, Richard. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you, Richard. It's uh, it was very interesting. I I would not followed all of those changes, and uh, thank you for keeping BBC Basic alive in the new century. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm doing my best. <laughs> now I'd like to say the same. Yes, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm, I'm not really qualified to ask any sensible questions, but I found it quite very interesting, especially now that all the um, 3D graphics and stuff that's now being brought in. Um, and the fact that- Yeah, I, I wanted to mention that because, you know, these days when you look at the competition, like things like Python, it's not so much the language that's important. All, all modern languages all do much the same things. I know Python's got hundreds of fancy extensions, but uh, it's not part of the area of the language that you can sort of start to distinguish them. I think one of the nice things about my recent BBC Basics is that all these sort of additional things like the 2D, 3D graphics, the physics simulation, the shader program, every one of the additions have those built in as standard. Even with Python, if you want to do that kind of thing, you have to pull in extensions like Pygame and you might hit uh, potential incompatibility between platforms or you might find there's a platform that doesn't have that particular extension available for Python. I honestly don't think there are many languages that can compete with my modern basics in terms of those kind of features. Yeah, no, it sounds exciting. I, I wish I'd have some time to play with, um, to play with it more, but uh, life gets in the way of fun things sometimes. Yes, we're working on something new for the new year to do with music, with BBC Basic, just to let you know. So there's some exciting things coming along, I think. Oh, are you? Music as well as graphics? Wow. Good. You mentioned um, OpenGL a couple of times. Is it uh, GL or GLES? Both. Um, depends on the platform, but again, um, thanks to SDL 2.0, that's hidden from you as a basic programmer. So at the moment, it's GL on uh, desktop platforms, Windows, Linux, uh, Mac OS, Raspberry, and, and it's GLES on Android and iOS and a sort of variety of GLES on uh, the in-browser version. But the differences are hidden from you by the libraries I've yeah, written. There's actually three libraries um, one that supports GL, one that supports GLES1, and another that supports GLES2, but they provide an identical interface to you as a basic programmer, so you don't have to worry about that. No, it was the shader side I was thinking about. Uh, yeah, that, fortunately, uh, the same applies. I, I was actually delighted to discover that, but the um, I've got a shader lib, and that also works on OpenGL or ES or ES2. They all work, so... Seems magic to me, but the shade is compatible as well. Oh, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Really enjoyed the presentation. Can I just um, add something, a, a quick couple of comments to my earlier questions? Apologies for not having a camera. Um, you mentioned um, uh, the waiting for vSync thing. Could you yes. not have? have a, a little um, 50 hertz timer running in the background that to mimic that, um, that was the first. Yeah, thing. I mean, I, 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 I skimmed over that because I was sort of short of time and it was a bit peripheral. I could solve that problem in Windows. I don't know whether you know about Windows, but there's all sorts of subsystems. And the one that BBC Basic uses for all its graphics is the old fashioned GDI 32 2D graphics subsystem. That doesn't provide any support whatsoever for synchronizing with the vertical retrace. But you can do it in Windows by using Direct Draw, which is another one of the multitudinous Windows subsystems. So it's not impossible, but I've never bothered to implement it. On the UC Basic for SDL 2.0, I was faced with a bit of a dilemma because I could have implemented the wait statement to wait for vSync. It's not a problem on SDL, it's supported. But if I had done that, I would have 
broken compatibility with BB Basic for Windows, which I didn't want to do. So it was a wild, tricky area. So what I have done is you can, with in BB Basic SDL 2.0, you can synchronize with vSync very easily, but you don't do it using the white stone. <laughs> Bit of an uh, unhappy compromise, but because I've lost, I've kept compatibility with these basic windows, which on balance I thought was most important, but I've lost compatibility with basic five on ARM as a result of that. But you, you certainly can do it. And I do have in my sort of wish list is a question mark, should I re sort of implement wait for vSync using the, um, the wait statement in VPC basic rest 2.0? zero and accept the loss of compatibility with the wind basic windows i'm not sure the right way to go there but you certainly on the sdl version you certainly can synchronize with vsync it's not a problem just do it in a different way yeah i was just thinking about um sort of legacy compatibility with your earlier versions but i just yeah. like to uh, echo what everyone else said a wonderful presentation and that i had had a go at writing some uh, a browser-based uh basic myself for sort of educational purposes um, and uh, I, I was looking at adding in the canvas thing hence the question about the yes, yes. canvas audio and gamepad uh, yes, yes. I'm lazy do... Sorry? I discovered but oh, sorry, I'm lazy I once I discovered SDL took all, you know did all that for you I've never bothered to need, needed to investigate the sort of underlying mechanisms that it's utilizing I expect it is doing it much the same way as you describe but as far as my code, code sees it, it's all the same, irrespective of the platform. SDL does a very good job of hiding the multitudinous platform differences from you. Yeah, I was wondering maybe you could have like, um, for just for simple programs where you wanted a sort of screen dump mode in console mode, that you could write out the screen buffer to a, an image file or something like that, maybe, or I don't know. Well, entirely I, possible. I mean, you've got the sys state. Once once sys is implemented, and all modern versions, I mean, basic five onwards, have got sys. You can basically do anything uh, through syscall. So I don't suppose it would need me to make any changes to the, the console. For example, the console mode basic to allow you to do that sort of thing. You just have to work out what OS functions you needed to call to achieve it and do that via sys. Uh, my, yeah. my existing yeah. libraries for say 3D graphics, they are just a basic wrapper around syscalls. Yeah, that'd be a nice way of doing it. Yeah. Um, I don't I, do anything I, in I don't do anything in um, C or assembly language if I if I can do it in basic at an acceptable speed. And when it comes to things like graphics, it's almost always IO bound. So the speed of the interpreter isn't a major issue. So I just code it in basic. I'm not sure what I did misunderstand when you, I'm sure you said something about con, it's some, one version being console only. I thought yes. it was the browser version, but I, I obviously right. got that wrong. But Which there, one I, is it? It's, there's a, it's a separate set of four console mode editions, which are for Windows, 64-bit Linux, 64-bit Windows, I should have said 64-bit Linux, 64-bit Mac OS, and Raspbian. Uh, I mean, you can compile it for others as Michael's done, but it's basically, I make available for desktop editions, console mode editions, but that's quite separate from the in-browser edition. The in-browser, it's a case of whether it's got SDL in the title. The BBC Basic console mode editions are nothing to do with SDL. The browser edition is, is BBC Basic SDL, 2.0, just like the, the other ones are. So that's fully compatible with all the graphics and what have you. All right, I see. Uh, ju just to say again, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful, um, uh, not product, but uh, <laughs> um, development. Um, and I, as, a, as a developer myself, I, I must say that I, uh, I really enjoyed the uh, hijacking of the dim statement with the curly brackets for structures. I thought that was really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I like it. Some people don't, um, but I, I think that's quite in keeping with the general way that BBC Basic does things. Yeah, nicely done. Thanks very much, Richard. One little thing I know just thought about from your presentation you've used um, at variables for um, your VDU variables 
Um, yes, you're going to tell me it's the wrong side of the I.O. processor, language processor divide, are you? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, later versions of um, ARM BBC Basic, um, which um, I've adopted with uh, Matrix Brandy, is mm. um, to take an approach you've used for other things and turn VDU into a function. Yes, I have seen that. Is that, yeah, what versions of BASIC support VDU as a function? Does, does Sophie's BASIC 5 do that? Um, I think, I don't think it's on the Archimedes level, but, I, but it's certainly on uh, RISC PC because yeah. I've, I've been using RPC MU as my um, definitive version of what I'm targeting. Yeah, I have not done that. I've got nothing against that at all. I think it's a very, very sensible thing to do, but I've not done that myself. I've just done it via these um, at variables, but yeah, it's an extension I, I could consider if you do it. <laughs> I already have. <laughs> You've done it, yeah. Uh, certainly for what I could implement of them, and as for the parameter, again, I've tried to make um, the, um, the risk os ones um, match up. Yeah, this is it. I'd have to see how sort of cross-platform-ish these parameters are, or to what extent I could adopt them. Mm -hmm. You add structures, I'll add VDU. Is that a deal? <laughs> structures is, of course, um, <laughs> the element in the room. <laughs> uh, i get that into Matrix Brandy because um, the upstream codes, I'm not sure how, how adaptable it is for that. Uh, of all the things I did, it was the most difficult, but probably the most rewarding as well. Um, I, I think um, we need to wrap up things up now because we have another presentation starting in less than five minutes. But I just thought I would run through some of the comments in the chat window here. Uh, Pixel Blitz says you have done uh, an amazing uh, job, uh, Richard. Um, and then um, Big Ed uh, says, excellent talk, Richard. Many thanks. Very interesting. Uh, Chris N says, your presentation was excellent. I'm inspired to take a look at BBC Basic for SDL. Um, Jonathan uh, uh, makes the comment that one of the advantages of, of BBC Basic for SDL is the ability to reuse 40 years of previous code, which is very true indeed. Um, Leonardo says, a very interesting, uh, thanks. Um, and um, yes, Phil Pemberton, I'm blown away by what you've done, Richard. Richard, great talk, thank you. Um, and I think that that's it. So once again, thank you very much indeed, Richard, for taking the time to do that. Uh, it was an excellent presentation and, and very interesting. Well, very welcome, a bit, bit outside my comfort zone, but you're more than welcome. <laughs> it was superb, thank you very much indeed.